Thank you. Can you all hear me? Cool. Privacy is the right to consent. It's the right to withdraw consent. It's the right to share information about yourself with only the people you want to share it with and at the time you want to share it. The modern debate around privacy has been perverted by talk of security and surveillance. And in that, a lot has been lost. Lost in that debate are the very real battles that everyone faces. You know, trying to hide your job search from your employer. Uh, teenagers trying to hide their social life from their parents. And queer people trying to live their lives. Those scenarios take on more serious tones when we discuss marginalized populations. People of color, indigenous and native populations, queer communities, sufferers and survivors of domestic violence, disabled people, undocumented immigrants, anyone who dwells outside the accepted norm of the culture that they reside in. And every population intersects with every other. Now, these are not distinct groups. Humanity is a tapestry. But today, I want to focus on one particular population. It's the one that I intersect with, and that's the queer population. Human sexuality and gender is complex and complicated. And in many parts of the world, people who are seen as being non-normative are heavily stigmatized and actively oppressed. Those who are queer still date, they still love, they still fuck. But they often do so with a constant fear of doubt and fear and sadness. I believe that the privacy and security community can build tools to make the lives of those people easier. We can't solve every social problem, but we can at least make a start at making those lives better. And finally, I believe that the movement has to be driven by those who are involved within that community. Nothing about us without us. Many modern companies and organizations promote software to keep data secret and private. These tools are awesome and the world is a better place because they exist. However, these tools are not perfect. You can read any study on how queer communities interact with them, interact with themselves, and you'll discover that queer communities don't use these tools. Much of the modern rhetoric around privacy is focused on state surveillance. But queer communities often need to hide things from their families, from their friends, from their employers, from their communities. Making friends, dating, escaping abusive situations, accessing healthcare, exploring themselves and others, finding jobs, engaging in safe sex work, are all aspects of queer life underserved by the modern tech environment. Because of this, we've been forced to adapt tools to our own uses. We've been forced to use tools that aren't perfect, that do put, at, do put us at risk. And I'm gonna share some of those stories with you today. I'm going to share the lives of people, and I hope that through telling those stories and revealing those lives to you, that you can perhaps enact a change in the world. Queer privacy is about understanding the challenges and the abuses of power impacting queer lives. It's about educating a new generation 
to the threat models that are pervasive in this world and that we have to defend. It's about building tools to destabilize and destroy a status quo which at best ignores queer people and at worst hunts them down, kills them, tortures them. Their only crime being to try to live in a world that believes their sexuality or gender is illegitimate. So this is queer privacy and thank you for coming. My name is Sarah. Um, I'm an independent privacy and security researcher. I focus on anonymity and trying to build tools to help people. In another life, I was a computer scientist for GCHQ in the UK, and after that, a corporate sellout at Amazon doing computer security. Since then, I've I've come to regret some of the choices I made. And I've come to want to help make the world better. So I wrote a book. And I compiled some essays called Queer Privacy. And in that book are are stories that aim to tell different aspects of queer lives. And like any allegory, they're there to make a point. Um, I just want to say thank you to the authors who contributed to this book. Um, I'm in a very privileged position to be able to share their stories with you today. And without their bravery, their courage, their willingness to write down their lives and put them out there, I wouldn't be here. Being queer often starts out with trying to find yourself, trying to discover who you are. And since the rise of the internet, that's become a whole lot easier. There are now a myriad of websites and chat rooms and, do we still use the word chat rooms? <laughs> Channels, chats, social media, all popularizing queer lives. Many queer people like myself found themselves on the internet. We found ourselves in the late 90s trying to work out what it is we were feeling, work out if it was normal, work out if there were other people like us. And you know, without the internet, I might be dead. But the internet also means that there are more consequences for queer lives. Trying to find yourself is a very random process. You might go through a dozen different feelings, identities. Children and teenagers have a tend to latch onto something that fits perhaps half of what they're feeling. They, they do not have the nuance to fully grasp the whole world. And they don't have the nuance to fully grasp the privacy implications of the stuff they put out there when they are young. I now want to tell you a story from a woman called Kath. Uh, Kath is a bisexual woman, woman. She lives in Manchester in the UK. And she wrote an essay in Queer Privacy about finding herself and what the internet meant to her. And I just want to read to you a, a short excerpt from her essay.
My parents, though traditional and working class, were keen that I stay on top of emerging tech trends. As a result, I was one of the first in my school peer group to get internet connection. The internet became a lifeline for me and remains so to this day. In addition to my bisexuality, I also am something of a BDSM enthusiast. My sexual preferences are far from vanilla. Chat rooms, websites, and yes, pornography, all contributed to helping me cope with my inclinations and preferences. On the social side, Kath was born in an online game. She was a hero of Azeroth, an MMO video game World of Warcraft. The freedom which comes from being represented by an avatar led me to the freedom, or led me to experiment with being more open about who and what I was. It remained a slow process, like a child learning to swim. I would dip a toe in and test the waters. Small pieces of my true self slowly revealed until I realized that, unlike my family, most people didn't care. Kath goes on in her essay to talk about her fear of surveillance and censorship on the internet. In particular, she talks about the current trend in the UK to push forward ever more oppressive surveillance legislation to allow SPs to block sites, to block pornography, to require people go out of their way to try and access content which should be readily available to them. She expresses concern for the future. She expresses worry and sadness over the state of the world and worries about others like her. Once you find yourself, you have to start living your life. Privacy is useless if you're in a cave with no one else around. For queer people, privacy in the context of living their lives comes from the freedom to do stuff and to experiment without repercussions. It comes from hiding their dating life from their family and friends until they're ready to come out. And it comes from separating parts of themselves that perhaps no one else ever sees. Another story in queer privacy comes from Ada. Ada lives in North Carolina, in the States. Uh, North Carolina currently most famous for its ridiculously oppressive trans laws, which Ada writes about, but it's not the thing I'm going to focus on right now. Ada is genderqueer and pansexual and very kinky. And she writes about her there. They write about their experiences. being kinky and being in the scene, while also trying to manage their family life. And I'm just going to read to you a very short statement about how they manage their privacy. I'm a single mom to two young kids. Yes, I mop up spilt yogurt and search for lost swim goggles. Yes, my car looks as though I ate three, three meals a day inside of it. I change diapers, heal goldfish, both real and imaginary. I bake muffins, I send chili to church for sick acquaintances. I read the same book over and over to the toddler, and I stay up late assembling dollhouses on Christmas Eve. It's lovely, exhausting, and if you need to be told, incredibly stressful. Sex is the easiest escape. Though my sex may not be the sex you picture, I'd specify that what you call sex is merely PIV sex, for penis and vagina. 
There are so many ways to have sex and so many body parts, both biological and prosthetic, to engage. I know I'll never get to everything on my kinky bucket list. The abundant yet specific nature of my kinky desires comforts me. Some of my play partners never see me undressed. None of them are given my name. My face doesn't appear on dating profiles. I use multiple email addresses and messaging apps to protect my legal name and privacy. Of course, I'm also protecting the fantasy of me. My suitors don't want to confront domestic me. Ada goes on to talk about the desire to run for office and how they worry that if they did, that their kinky life, this life where they are free to express, this life that they use for an escape, collides. They're worried about getting their, having their kids taken away from them. They're worried about that part of their humanity being used to deprive them of another. Domestic violence is a huge problem, both in terms of humanity and specifically in terms of the queer community. There's a horrendous trend right now of abusers using technology to control their victims. And there is sadly a corporate marketplace where companies are willing to sell products to fund this awful trend. I'll come back to domestic violence. But I want to jump to healthcare. Accessing healthcare, particularly for queer communities and in, in specific for trans communities, is a very, very difficult process. It often requires lying to multiple doctors. It requires getting pills under the counter. It requires much expense and community funding and safety to make it happen. And I'm going to tell you a story that combines domestic violence and healthcare, as well as sex work. Queer communities regularly rely on sex work to live, to survive. Trans people, and in particular trans women of color, are often, often have sex work as their only way of earning income, particularly in the first part of their lives in transition. As a community, as a As people who build secure tools, we should be able to protect people who are doing sex work, who are, access, who are trying to access healthcare, who are suffering domestic violence. And if we can't help those people, then what's the fucking point? And I'm gonna tell you a story written by Morgan. Morgan is a trans guy who lives in the UK. And Morgan's story intersects with these three areas. Morgan writes about his experiences with domestic violence, his experiences with sex work, and his experiences accessing healthcare and helping others access healthcare. And I'm just going to read to you a short segment. For a long time, the threat for me wasn't just the state or identity thieves. More than anyone else, it was my partner. For three years, I was in an abusive relationship where my then boyfriend cyber-stalked me. 
He used our shared network to get access to my browser history. He would use that information to pretend he knew me better than I knew myself and to exploit my fears. He also used a keylogger to get at my email password and therefore all my social media passwords and made my email account passively forward every email I sent and received. He regularly looked at my phone too. None of my written communication was private. If I wanted private communication, I had to call people or speak to them in person. But of course, my boyfriend curbed my social life by undermining my self-esteem and explicitly forbidding me to talk to some of my friends. He blocked my ex's friends from my Facebook account in a fit of jealousy, and it felt less embarrassing to let them believe that I impulsively cut them out of my life than to tell them the truth about my controlling boyfriend. Earlier on in his essay, Morgan talks about his experiences with sex work and with healthcare. And I'm going to read this passage because I think it's a very nice demonstration of how current privacy tools are being used by queer communities, and it provides some hope in this otherwise depressive talk. Trans people are constantly denied access to healthcare in the UK. There are a lot of online support groups that have varying levels of privacy and anonymity, and the most discussed topics are how to navigate the healthcare system to gain access to hormones or other gender-affirming treatment. I use Signal, an end-to-end -end encrypted secure messaging app to discuss hormones with trans people who are struggling to get them on the NHS. If I'm careful, I'm able to get them testosterone, but I can't, often when they can't get it because the NHS is too slow, and dismissive, or the cost of private care is too high. Morgan's story is important because it intersects with so many of the issues that queer people face. It's a clear, terrible, but also positive outlook on the state of privacy in these communities. Morgan ends his essay talking about how privacy technology saved him. He talks about how learning how to use a password manager, learning how to use two-factor authentication enabled him to take control of his privacy again, to help him feel like he had a safe space, to help him rebuild his life again after the horrendous treatment at the hands of his boyfriend. Sure what happened there. I'm now going to talk about a subject that's that is emotional and it is That's raw. There are times as a queer person and through and everyone in the queer community where you lose control. Where you lose control of your story, your identity, your your life. There, there are times when your life is no longer in your hands. And there's times when you feel like you have to escape. 
and sadly, the suicide rate for queer people, particularly queer children, is very, very high. It shouldn't be as high as it is, and it's a damnation on humanity that it is as it is. Abby lives in the US and writes a story about their sibling. Their sibling was called Skylar, and Skylar killed themselves. I'm going to read to you a part of Skylar's suicide note. Because I think it's important. In conclusion, I am a depressed teen like many others. However, what I am not is a sob story. Don't turn my name into a hashtag. Don't treat this like a glory suicide fest. I'm not killing myself because I am trans and queer. However, what I do know is that when trans and queer kids complete suicide, that there is a chain reaction. This is only heightened by the media portrayal of us being sob stories. I am not a sob story. Don't turn me into one. And the reason I read Skylar's words and the reason I talk about losing control is that after Skylar published their note and took their own life, there was a media reaction. The media latched on to Skylar's story and perverted it. The media misgendered him. The media presented stories from Skylar's relatives that were factually incorrect. The words spoken at Skylar's funeral were not representative of, the, of him. Sometimes privacy isn't about living lives. Sometimes it's about being respected in death. Sometimes it's about the right to preserve our own stories. I don't know if there's a technical solution. There probably isn't. But it's an important story to tell. Online harassment is great. As someone who gets, as someone who has open messages on Twitter, it can be an interesting show. Offline harassment is just as bad. Queer people, especially trans women, suffer it more than they should. Violet. which is a pseudonym. Writes about harassment on social media and queer privacy. She tells a story of She tells a story that warns of the dangers of focusing too much on anonymous harassment. Because the truth is that harassment, especially to queer people, is almost never anonymous. The public figures in the world, the governments, the corporate speakers, the vile charities and organizational groups that target queer people, don't do so anonymously. They do so under their real names. They do so so they can raise funding. Social media sites, honestly, and how Violet writes it under her experience, 
working in these groups. Love harassment campaigns. They are very engaging. They're very useful when you want to target advertisements. And the solutions put forward by these groups, the solutions put forward to end online harassment almost exclusively focus on forcing people out into the light. They focus on these anonymous trolls. When the truth is that the solutions they put in place, real name policies, in particular, almost exclusively target the queer community. There are by now hundreds, if not thousands of stories online of queer people being outed by their social networking site. Whether through the social networking site flagging their name or flagging their name change as being not real and actively reverting their profile, or whether it's people in their lives maliciously reporting their profile as fake and them not having the legal documentation to prove that they are who they say they are and who they are. We need to build social spaces that allow people to express themselves. I, I am personally not a fan of hate speech legislation despite being on the receiving end of hate speech more times than I can care to count. But I do believe that we need to give people tools to control their online lives, to be able to escape from that harassment when they want to. Online dating as a queer person is a mixed bag. On the one hand, online dating has made it ridiculously easy for queer people to have sex and to find people because they can do so much safer now than going to some random bar in the middle of a dodgy alley. However, in many countries, and still in even modern countries, countries with good queer human rights laws, online dating is still a mixed bag. Particularly with the, ocean, particularly with the integration of social networks, Online dating has become a potential outing vector for many queer people. You have to sign up with your Facebook account or you have to link it in some way. That can be really bad for someone who's trying to discover if they like girls or trying to work out if they are one. Audrey writes in Queer Privacy about her and her boyfriend wanting to explore polyamory. And in particular, wanting to explore polyamory because in their 30s, they both worked out that they were bisexual and they wanted to play with that. And they used online dating to try and find people and were really successful at it. But Audrey writes in the book that this was really only possible because her and her partner lived in New Zealand, thousands of miles away from the US where their families were. And their families would not have been accepting of this kind of relationship or those kinds of sexualities. In particular, their, their social group, active on their social network, might have been able to work out who they were looking for just by going onto the same dating sites that they were using. And it was only safe in another country with kind of location-based online dating that they had that 
space to be free. There are plenty of stories about queer people in the Middle East who are often targeted for abuse by the government, by the police, and by their communities. But you know, people are gonna fuck, and nothing in the world will prevent people from finding love if they really want it. And so people use these apps. And these apps are not designed for that kind of hostile environment. They leak data about who you are, where you are. The only way we can protect those people and to protect people like Audrey is by making those applications more privacy preserving, by making them more consensual, by understanding that when we put location-based services into an application or or when we ask people for information, to understand how that information might be used against them, might be used by malicious actors. And it's only by understanding that that we can, we can move past the world that we're in. The last story I want to share from queer privacy is about advocacy. Um, and it was written by Norman. Norman writes about how privacy orgs in particular are failing to understand the needs of the transgender community. Norman writes about how the guides that we use are badly worded at best and outright offending at worst. Many of the guides that are put out there and targeted at trans people talk about fake accounts, pseudonymous accounts, you know, alternative identities, you know, terms which the transgender community probably doesn't agree with and perhaps outright rejects. And Norman's essay is a stark reminder that even people who really care about these issues, if they don't listen to the community, if they don't seek feedback, if we don't fully understand the stories that I've talked to you about today and others that I hope you will hear in the future, then, then we're doomed to give bad advice and we are doomed to be useless in the face of oppression. I have told you lots of stories. My story is one of compiling this book. My story is one of being afraid to hold my partner's hand in public. My story is one of being harassed on the street or and having to having to argue with hotel receptionists about whether me and my partner can share a room. It's fucked up. And it's why I wrote this book. Now I want to talk about your story. I want to talk about where we go from here. I want to talk about what we can do about this and how you can help. Fascism is alive. It's not a myth of history. It is marching an ever more ominous tone and the truth is it's probably going to keep going. And queer people are going to be on the forefront progress on trans rights, on gay rights, on civil rights, and human rights has halted in many areas of the world, and in some cases it's reversing. 
the train has been running on borrowed tracks. While a government is powerful enough to give, it is powerful enough to take away. We can no longer afford to have optimism in progress being a one-way street. The right to self-determination, the right to build and raise a family, the right to health care are all being eroded, and they are especially being eroded for queer communities right now around the world. As I speak to you today, there are multiple pieces of legislation in God knows how many countries right now that roll back or simply actively oppress people just because of who they are, because they don't conform to some cis-heteronormative ideal of humanity. There are laws that make it difficult for trans people to obtain any kind of health care. There are laws that deny equal rights to non-heterosexual couples. There are laws that make it impossible for polyamorous partners to visit their loved ones in hospital. And there are laws that ignore or deny non-binary people the right to self-determination. And that's just the US. As a society, we're really at a fork in the road right now. One of those forks leads us to a world that is more consensual, where people do have self-determination, where governments can't oppress people because of who they fuck or who they are. The other fork, there are a lot of dead people in that fork. As a community, we either live fully and without exception, or we die. I choose to believe that we can grow and love, and I choose to believe that we can live in a world where I don't have to fear holding my partner's hand, where I don't have to fear for my friends around the world. You know, I choose to believe in a world where I don't have to fear. That this is real life. There's no next time around. But all of those were just words, and words are nothing without action. And actions are nothing without infrastructure. So today I'm going to ask you a few things that I hope you take with you today through the conference. And when you leave and go back to wherever you live, and you put these things into the software that you build or secure, or the systems that you engineer, I want you to exercise compassion, not just for those around you, but for those you perhaps haven't met or for the stories you haven't been told to think about how a system that you're building or securing can harm people, to think about how malicious people can take control of your system to harm others, to think about how your system can be used to protect people, to actively, actively build compassion into your products. This isn't a technical thing, it's just a thing. People are dying right now. People are in pain right now. Long-term goals and aims of infrastructure are great, but sometimes you need to help people right now. Crisis orgs, suicide hotlines, people working on the ground in these places to provide safe shelter are really important, and without them, we can't protect as many people as we should. And I want you to start enforcing consent.
Our privacy is nothing if we don't demand it and if we don't demand it for others. Using tools like Signal, like Tor, using tools that actively remove the ability of any part party to spy on your communications, not only protects you, but it protects everyone else. If these tools are normalized, then it's not suspicious if someone has Signal installed on their phone when a partner looks at it. It's not suspicious when someone is always using encryption in their communications. It's not suspicious when people use password managers or two-factor authentication. These things need to be normalized so that we can protect people. Privacy is a herd immunity problem. And unless everyone demands their right to privacy, unless everyone stands up and says that they do not consent to their communications being spied on, that they do not consent to their lives being put on show without their informed, consensus consent, then we lose people. And yeah, we need to build alternatives. We need to make the world better actively by by building new information structures, by building new dating apps that protect gay people, by working out ways to bring healthcare to more people, by working on ways to save people from domestic violence situations, by making it easier for sex workers to do their work safely and privately. Those alternatives are sitting there. This isn't a hard tech problem. This is not flying to space. This is not fusion. This is applying compassion to technology and building solutions that matter. So I'm gonna leave you with this, that privacy is consent and that the tools that you use are going to be used by people to find themselves, to live, to date, to do sex work, to fuck, to love, and maybe even to die. And I hope that you will remember that the next time you have to make a choice. Thank you. Okay, plenty to think about. Uh, questions? Well, Sarah answered everything herself. No questions? Um, Sarah, your book is really important. However you define yourself, where can people read your book? How can people get hold of the book and read the stories for themselves and see... Um, where you're going with this. Yeah, so the book's available as an ebook on LeanPub or as a physical copy pretty much anywhere you can buy a physical copy. Um, you can find me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Sarah Jamie Lewis. I'm pretty easy to find, despite being a privacy activist. Where do you see this going now? You've published the book. The book's been out there. You're talking about this. Where do you see this going um, the next step is to take some of these stories forward to put them into new technology. Um, I'm currently working on a project called Queer Hacking, which is telling the stories of people trying to build this technology, trying to make the world better through tech, trying to partially not solve social problems, but ease them to allow people to live their lives. Um, that's going to occupy most of my next year, trying to fold that in together. Any questions? Any more questions in the audience? Okay. Well, thank you again, Sarah. Thank you.